It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker is um, Dr. William Winslade. Uh, we had a conversation, he and I, uh, a few months ago about ethical issues and affecting older patients, and uh, it was fascinating. His, his, his cases and the things that he's seen and had to make decisions on and, and, and consult on has been uh, amazing work. Uh, and he also uh, recently provided a, a talk for us for our surgery symposium about uh, the care for elderly patients in surgery. Um, so uh, there's a, a bio there about his many accomplishments, and um, I'd like to uh, bring up our, uh, Dr. Winslet to talk about ethical issues confronting the elderly patient, uh, competency, consent, and advanced care planning, and to inform that none of our speakers today have any commercial affiliations to disclose. One thing I don't do is technical things, even dealing with PowerPoint. Uh, I have a I have a virus that affects all technology. <laughs> I went to the dentist the other day and they were trying to take an x-ray because I had something going on in my back molar and so they had this, this machine that you know, goes around so they took the x-ray blank. <laughs> he said, this has never happened before. I said, don't worry, it's me, not your machine. But they, they fixed it. And it was really interesting, uh, just as an aside, you know, I had pain every time I would bite down, and I thought, oh my God, I've got an infection, I've got some problem. Well, it wasn't possible because I have no nerves in that tooth. I have a crown on the tooth. There was no infection, but the crown had gotten slightly loose, and my upper teeth were coming down, hitting the crown, causing pressure. And all he did was just file down those upper teeth a little bit, and the pain went away. I wish it were always that easy. Yeah. Okay, my topic today, ethical issues confronting the elderly patient, competency, competency, consent, and advanced care planning. I'm not going to talk about advanced care planning primarily with respect to end-of-life issues, although I'll be happy to answer questions if you have any. But I want to connect advanced care planning with ongoing care for the elderly who have impaired competency. This, uh, this is our book, Clinical Ethics, that I co-authored with uh, two other colleagues. This is the fifth edition of the Clinical Ethics book. We're now actually working on the sixth edition. We first published it in 1982. Um, I'll leave a copy of this with Tony, which you can keep in your library. Great. There's a section in this book on decisional capacity and informed consent. I'm going to be talking about it, but I'm not going to be reading from the book. So if you want more details or additional examples, you feel free to uh, take a look at this book. If you want a copy of the book, uh, I think we have some, and I can sell them to you at the price I paid the publisher, which is, I think, 25% off. They don't give me much of a discount. But uh, if you're interested, take a look at it, and feel free to, to use it. Okay, let's go on. In our book, we talk about how to think about ethical issues in clinical practice. And it's really a very simple model. It doesn't tell you what the answer is, but it helps you organize your thinking. So for, for any particular medical problem, the first thing you have to look at, of course, are what are the medical indications for treatment? I'm not a physician. One of my colleagues that works on this book is a physician. Uh, he wrote that chapter. He explains how you make a determination that some medical treatment is needed. We talk about the goals of medicine and what to do if you can't reach the goals or if only you can reach the goals partially and so on. I'm not going to be talking about medical indications today, but that, that's certainly the first step you take. The second step with respect to any recommended treatment is what the patient wants or doesn't want. And so patient preferences becomes very important. And I'll illustrate this in a moment with uh, several cases, but it's obvious that in our medical system and in the legal system of the United States that physicians are authorized to make recommendations to their patients. Their patients have the right and the duty to decide do they want to do what the physician recommends or do they want to do something else or go somewhere else or just refuse all treatment? 
physicians have an obligation to explain to patients why their recommendation is a good one and tell them what the risks are if they don't follow the recommendation and the consequences if they don't get treatment and so on. But there are only two contexts in which patients can be treated against their will without their consent or without somebody's authorization. And that is if they have an emergency life-threatening condition and they're not able to decide for themselves. I mean, if you have an emergency life-threatening condition and you walk into the emergency room and you're competent, you can refuse treatment. So for example, an 80-year-old man walks into the emergency room because his emphysema is bothering him. He's been in and out of the hospital before. He's been on a respirator for, from time to time. He comes in and they say, oh my God, your oxygenation isn't good enough. We're going to have to put you on a respirator right away. And he says, you know, will I have to stay on a respirator? Well, we don't know. Maybe. He says, no, thank you. And he can leave. Even though he has an emergency life-threatening condition, if he's competent, he can leave. Similarly, somebody comes in and needs a pacemaker replaced. Uh, the battery's dead. They don't want to do it. They don't have to. Now, that's a bad idea, perhaps, but a competent adult has a right to refuse treatment or to consent to treatment recommended by their physician. I'm going to not spend a lot of time on the details of patient preferences because I'm going to be concentrating on competency, but I just wanted to put that in the background. Let me also say, though, competency is a legal concept. In the United States, every adult is presumed to be competent legally unless and until they are adjudicated. That is, a judge says they're not competent. So this is, and this presents a real dilemma for clinicians taking care of elderly patients. Because unless they've got a legal guardian, or a court has ruled that they're not competent, when you're dealing with an elderly patient, the law presumes that they're competent. And incidentally, it's not very easy to get a guardianship for an elderly patient. You ha they have to be really shown to be unable to manage their affairs and really be pretty out of it before the judge is going to take away their liberty, their authority to decide for themselves. Well, nevertheless, in medical practice, you have to make decisions and you have to deal with people who may be legally competent, but they have impaired capacities. And I'll talk about the kinds of impairments that you encounter that you're more familiar with than I uh, in a moment. But uh, in, in our approach to medical ethics, we talk about decision-making capacity or incapacity, even if somebody's legally competent. Now, the easy case is where somebody's unconscious. So somebody's brought into the emergency room after an automobile accident, and they're unconscious. Well, then they're incompetent because they can't decide for themselves, because they can't communicate. And so there, we provide life-saving treatment for somebody who is obviously incompetent. But if somebody's talking, they're communicating, it makes it hard. Because sometimes people come into the emergency room and they've, uh, they're physically ill, or they're emotionally upset, or they've got uh, declining cognitive capacities then it's a real problem, and it's a real problem not just in the emergency room, but elsewhere. Now, the only other area where we can involuntarily treat people against their will is if they are mentally ill, as a result of which they're dangerous to themselves or others or likely to deteriorate. And even if they refuse treatment, if they're mentally ill, you can treat them for their mental illness uh, involuntarily. Otherwise, people have to either decide for themselves that they want to be treated or they have to have somebody who's legally authorized to consent on their behalf. So you heard about advanced care planning previously from Cheryl Viani. Somebody has a medical power of attorney and they become incompetent, then their agent can consent or refuse treatment on their behalf. I'm going to talk about the role of the agent for patients who may have an advanced directive or a medical power of attorney even though they're not fully incompetent but only 
have impaired capacity or partial incompetence. Now, finally, uh, the other two areas in medical ethics that we cover in our book, quality of life, which I, in the part of this talk that I heard at the end, clearly uh, there are many aspects of quality of life. End of life feeding and hydration is just one of many quality of life issues. And one of the things I want to say about this is quality of life is a very subjective matter. What would be an adequate quality of life for me might not be for somebody else. And another person might accept a condition that another, that another person wouldn't accept. So some people can tolerate physical disability, but they would, they would abhor the idea of being mentally incapacitated. And some people can deal with mental incapacity as long as they're physically all right. So you have to be uh, alert to the fact that it's very difficult to make quality of life judgments for other people based on your values. Quality of life judgments need to be made on the basis of the values of the person whose life it is. And then contextual features refers to all of these other sort of grab bag of things, religious beliefs, legal issues, research questions, economic considerations, and so on. I'll, I'll talk about some of those as we go on. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I've talked about medical indications. Let's go on to the next slide. Patient preferences. Let's talk about competence and capacity and now focusing on the decision-making capacity. And feel free at any point to ask questions or make comments either here in this audience or people uh, at the remote locations. Because if I'm saying something that you want to me you to know, elaborate on or you think I'm saying something that's off the wall, uh, please let me know. How do we decide if somebody has a capacity to make decisions for themselves given that they're legally competent? Well, what are those things? Let me ask you. What do you think? Just, just commonsensically, this is not rocket science. Ability to communicate. Ability to communicate. Right. And so in particular, in the context of medical care, the person has to be able to uh, communicate their choices. So that's one thing. What else? It's easy. Well, how, do you, how do you know? How, uh, let, me, uh, let me point out that when you want to find out if somebody has decision-making capacity, whether you're a physician, a nurse, a social worker, a family member, or an, an admissions clerk in a hospital, what do you do? You have a conversation. Do they make sense? Do they make sense? Do they have an ability to understand? Do they make sense is sort of the global notion, but you've got to, you ask people questions to find out if they're, you know, in the ball game, as we say. And uh, in the context of healthcare, do they appreciate the medical situation that they're in? Do they understand that they've got a problem? And do they understand the consequences? But sometimes they can calculate their, you know, they're very good at it. So unless, if it's a person asking them questions and that person is new, I mean, we see this a lot in the nursing homes. Um, we know the patient really is confabulating, but then other people who come, it's making sense. And you're absolutely right. You can't just tell from an initial surface conversation, and I'm going to say, how you go about finding out additional information about patients. If you don't know a patient, you better rely on somebody else who does. If it's in a nursing home, it's the staff of the nursing home, family members, other people. Quite often, people who have impaired capacity don't know themselves that their capacities are impaired. So you've got to, you've got to do a little homework. But it's exactly what you said. Uh, if you... And that happens a lot, you know, the patients are sent here and they're seen by a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist sees the patient very quickly. <laughs> they say Never the trust fine. anybody <laughs> that does anything quickly when it comes to determining competency. It is not that easy to do. You're absolutely correct. Uh, and I'm going to give you an example in a minute of a case that I worked on where I was convinced that I knew what was going on and, each, and you know, I had to change my mind about half a dozen times because once you start looking beneath the surface, it turns out that sometimes people who appear to be incompetent really aren't because they have 
strange speech habits, or they may not be as articulate or as educated as you might be. They may, they may speak in, in uh, colloquialisms. And, and uh, you've got to learn the person's language. Uh, I'm, a, I'm trained as a psychoanalyst, among other things. And one of the things I learned as a psychoanalyst in listening to patients is that I can't tell what somebody means by what they say until I understand what their language is. I mean, we all speak in English, but people don't mean the same things with the words that they use. Uh, I was talking to my 83-year-old mother this morning in preparation for this talk to see you know, if she would give me any good examples of people with impaired capacity. And I, I realized another thing that I was going to point out to you. Early in the morning, she's pretty alert. <laughs> About 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and even worse, at 7.30, before she's about to fall asleep in front of the television, uh, I can't have the same kind of conversation I have with her in, in the morning. And actually, she's pretty with it. I mean, she doesn't have any illnesses. She doesn't have any problems. She's got a good living situation. Uh, her biggest problem is you know, who she's going to play bridge with that day because her mind's still active. And I can, but I can see little traces, losses of capacity that she used to have. And that's true for all of us. Our memories get slower. We can't remember things. So, you know, it's, and I've spent some time in some nursing homes talking to people. It's, it's not that easy. You've got to learn their language. You've got to learn how to talk. And, of course, as you get more skilled, you can do this faster because there are certain things you can do to kind of probe to see whether somebody's in the ballgame or not. One other thing is whether they can deliberate. If they've got to make a decision about whether to have a medical treatment or not, they also have to have the capacity to think about it. They have to understand, they have to communicate, they have to be able to deliberate. Now, I'm carefully avoiding saying they have to make the right choice. You don't have to make what the best choice. You have to be able to deliberate about it, but somebody might decide, you know, maybe I'll live with, I've got this bad shoulder and the surgeon says I really need to have my rota rotator cuff operated on. But you know what? I'm right-handed. Uh, it isn't really bother. I'm not in pain. I think I'll wait about that. Well, the doctor says you need to have the surgeon. No, I don't. Uh, I have a choice. And I just came, incidentally, from Indiana where I visited my 85-year-old father and he made exactly that decision. The surgeon said, well, I can get in there and uh, fix your rotator cuff. What for? He decided not to do it. Now, when he was in pain, he was more tempted to do it. And I don't want to sort of uh, you know, uh, take advantage of my parents here, but uh, he made the right decision. On the other hand, my mother, 10 years ago, was a crippled, bent over old lady with arthritis because she had spinal stenosis. And I actually brought the x-rays out here and had Dr. Now to take a look at them. And he looked at them and said, <laughs> that's not good. And she was in so much pain, she really couldn't decide what to do. I and mean, she was, so I'll do anything. Just, let, just fix it. She had the surgery 10 years ago. She's fine. She was very lucky. In fact, she was so excited about that that she had two hips replaced the same year. <laughs> And without the surgery, she would have been crippled and depressed and miserable. But she told me later that she really, if I hadn't been there to sort of tell her what to do, to go ahead and do the surgery, she wouldn't have known what to do. And she didn't even remember all of the things that went on because she was in so much pain. She said, I was just in so much pain, I couldn't think about it. Her she was legally competent, but she was impaired. And of course, the physicians understood that. And so they recognized that I was really speaking for her, even though I didn't have her medical power of attorney, because in California, you've got to be a resident of California to be their agent. And so, uh, but you know, we all know that family members who are not in conflict with the other family member are the best source of information about what's going on with this person. So let me give you another way to think about competence and capacity, think of the three C's. 
comprehension, I'm sorry, two C's, CEC, comprehension, evaluation, and choice. Patients have to comprehend what's going on. They have to be able to make their own evaluations, and they have to be able to choose. Well, you know what? People may be able to comprehend, sort of, and they may be able to choose, but they may not be able to evaluate. And here's where I think that we have missed a real opportunity in healthcare to facilitate decision making. Advanced care planning shouldn't just be for when people are at the end of life or when they're totally incompetent. It would be very sensible to have another person who is designated to be your assistant, your helper when you make medical decisions. In fact, when you go to the hospital, as those of you who work in hospitals know, you should never go alone. If you're lucky enough to have somebody to be with you, that's the best way to protect yourself against all of the things that can go wrong. And it's true for decision making as well. You want to have somebody along who can help clarify or ask questions that you aren't going to think of because you're in pain or because you're distracted or because you're afraid or whatever it is. Or because your memory isn't too good and you can't remember exactly what was said a few minutes before or put it all together. So advanced care planning can go along with impaired competency to facilitate decision making and make sure that the patient's values are the ones that are going to be respected. And ordinarily, uh, a concerned family member is going to be the best person to do that. But in some cases, especially if you got, you know, like a large Italian family or a large Irish family like uh, my wife's family, you better have designated somebody uh, as the designated uh, speaker because otherwise you're going to have eight voices they are all going to be saying different things. So think of advanced care planning not only in terms of when a person's totally incompetent but also when they're in nursing homes or when they're impaired. And let me talk about the kinds of impairments that can get in the way of decision making capacity. Cognitive impairment. This is a big one. Lots of people that you in the geriatric community deal with have varying degrees of dementia, from mild dementia to severe dementia to Alzheimer's disease. Now, just because somebody has dementia doesn't mean they can't communicate anything. They might be able to make a choice, but they might not be able to deliberate, or they might only partially understand. And even if a person doesn't have dementia, Many old people, and I include myself uh, uh, getting into that group of people that can't remember things. I can't remember names like I used to. You know, I used to be, and I can remember numbers, but I can't remember names. It takes me a while. I have to think, what's that name? You know, and five minutes later, I might think of it. Well, many people have problems processing information because they can't remember exactly what's said or their attention isn't as sharp as it used to be. And so you have to take into consideration all of those cognitive memory deficiencies that we all have to some degree and some older people have it more than others. It doesn't necessarily mean they're incompetent but they may not be fully able to make decisions on their own without assistance. Emotional issues. Since I've spent a lot of time visiting my elderly parents and some of their friends, I have seen a wide variety of emotional changes in older people and depression is a very big one. Many older people are depressed, especially when they think they have to go to the doctor and even worse if they have to go to the hospital. Well, depression interferes with your ability to deliberate. Doesn't mean that you're clinically depressed or that you're uh, you know, in need of uh, psychiatric medication, but depression is a common condition, especially if people have suffered lots of losses. So my father was, uh, was depressed for a year after his wife died. He knew it, but it didn't mean that he was functioning at his full capacity. 
And even still, it's been a year and a half, he's, you can still see traces of it. And then, on the other hand, people of all ages, but particularly the elderly, tend to be in denial about things that they need to do but don't want to. I mean, I'm pretty much in denial about having to go to the dentist until my tooth really hurts, because I don't like it. Because, uh, you know, they're going to they're gonna hurt me. And it, I know when I was a kid, I went to a dentist that didn't believe in anesthesia. And so I had all these fillings in my mouth without any anesthesia. And so I, even though there's no pain now, I grip the chair with my arms real, I have to remind myself, hey, I don't have to do that. Uh, but, and I, I notice I have a tendency to postpone going. Well, this is typical, this is normal human reaction, but you have to take into consideration with any person that you're dealing with, are there emotional factors that are affecting them? And you may not know it until you ask them the right questions. So somebody who is depressed might be depressed because somebody died in their family and they haven't had a chance to talk about it. And that can affect their ability to make decisions. So you, you know, you, these are common sense things, but I'm speaking now not just as a person in ethics, but as a psychoanalyst, I know that these things are, are relevant. And finally, physical conditions. Hypertension, fever, infection, brain injury, pain, and drug reactions are all things that can impair your capacity to make decisions for yourself. Elderly people are prone to falls. A lot of times people fall, they hit their head, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong, but they still have uh, impairments as a result of the injury. Uh, and unfortunately, we know also that older people who fall that have brain injuries don't heal as quickly or don't heal at all because their brains are more fragile than they used to be. Closed head injury is often a cause for personality and behavioral changes that can't be explained in any other way. So you have to make sure that you've done an adequate medical history to find out whether somebody... Um, has hypertension because if, if their blood pressure is off, so is their thinking, so is their attitude. For example, patients on dialysis are free to refuse to continue dialysis at any time. But at what point do you allow somebody to refuse dialysis? Not right before they need dialysis <laughs> because that's when they're going down if they're going to refuse, you have to do that after they've had, just had the dialysis because that's when they're in their best condition to make judgments. So this is, this is, as I said, not rocket science, but there are so many different variables that you have to take into consideration that you have to know the patients you're dealing with, you have to know something about their lives, you have to know something about their mood on that day, uh, their moods fluctuate, when people are in a bad mood, you don't necessarily want to have them making major decisions about their life. Uh, also, if they're in a sort of false euphoria, you don't want people to be making decisions. So sometimes if it's a medical decision that needs to be made, you, you give them a chance to think about it, make a tentative decision, and then confirm later if that's really what they want to do. Now that's if it's not something that has to be done right away. So these are all just some tips for you. Let me add, in addition to just what you said at the beginning, you have a conversation, you also observe their behavior because you don't want to just rely on what people say. You, and you may not be able to observe directly if you don't have the time, then you have to talk to people that have been around them. Have, have there been any changes? Are they acting differently? Are they acting strangely? Um, what's their normal? behavior? Is this normal for them? Are they, are they agreeing with you just because they're trying to be nice? I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people who are in their 80s and 90s, and this generation of 80 and 90 year olds, tend to be very agreeable and deferential to people in authority. Even my mother, who's not deferential and agreeable, is deferential to her doctor. And I, I was, I've been to the doctor with her, and I thought, who is this woman? <laughs> uh, and she would say that that's true. Uh, it's, it's a very, it's a very uh, interesting phenomenon. And so 
you have to factor in, are they being straight with you? Are they telling you, what, you know, is this really what they want? Is this really what they're willing to do? Because you don't want people to agree to something they didn't want to do because then they're going to sabotage it later anyway. So you've got to observe behavior. Talk with third parties. Now, you've got to be careful here. You don't want to talk to third parties that think they know that don't. And so some family members are more reliable than others. So the distant cousin from Chicago isn't going to be able to tell you as much as the cousin that lives five minutes away. But you also have to factor in the, the one who lives five minutes away may be more protective or less, less you know, uh, uh, informative because they think they know what's best for their elderly relative. Then how do you find the balance? There's no magic formula here. You have to, you have to have some conversation and then if that's not good enough or if you're in doubt, trust your intuitions. Because if you don't feel like the conversation has gotten to the point where you really feel comfortable with what's going on, talk some more. And check with some other people. It's good to have a team approach. If you, I mean, obviously it's ideal to have more than one person participating in the conversation. Some people who are listening, some people who are talking, some people who are you know, you know, doing both. Um, you can use various kinds of tests if you're really in doubt, especially if you're doing, thinking about a risky procedure. Uh, you, can, you can test people's depression level, you can test their comprehension. I mean, in the brain injury area, which I know a lot more about, we have all kinds of tests that we give people to find out whether they're confabulating or whether they really know what they're doing or whether their attention span is bad or what, because people with brain injuries tend to not want people to know that there's something wrong and so they try to hide it and they say they can do things that they can't. So I, one thing I'm particularly interested in is driving and uh, there's a very complicated test that you give people with brain injuries to see if they have the proper attention span. Well, similarly with elderly people in driving. I mean, you all know, as I do, that if you're over 70 and you're under 24, that's the high risk area for driving. And, you know, th those are the kinds of things you want to find out. Uh, if somebody is losing their capacities, then you have to sort of think about what can you do about it. Um, as your previous speaker was saying, sometimes when you're dealing with people nearing the end of life, even if they're not dying, you're trying to provide care. You're not trying to cure everything. So that's why my dad didn't have the surgery on his shoulder. He doesn't need to do that. He's not playing tennis. Uh, he's not left-handed. He, he sort of functions fine. But you're trying to in enhance the quality of life. And so sometimes surgery is appropriate. So for my mother, the back surgery, the hip replacements, man, that made, a, that made her a totally different person. Um, when you have somebody that can't make up their mind, you negotiate. Um, I wanna, don't wanna, I wanna, I've got a case I want to give you. Okay, all right. Um, you negotiate with the patient, you negotiate with the family. We can see what's on the next slide. I don't even remember here. You see what I'm saying? It, this is a problem. There we go. I've already told you this, but this is to remind you what I've just said, in case you forgot <laughs> and you're having memory problems, uh, that I'm, I'm focusing on competence and capacity, but this is all for the purpose of making informed consent meaningful. It's not enough for people just to agree to do something. They have to, they have to be able to participate in this dialogue. And uh, my recommendation in informed consent is that if you don't have to decide instantly, you, you do it uh, where people have a chance to think about it and do later. Now, I've got a a case I want to give you to sort of illustrate a number of these things. And I'm going to leave this also with Tony, and I'm sure he'll make copies for you if you want it. This is a fascinating case. I call this gentleman Mr. T. And I, I need to disclose to you that, that he and his family all agreed that we could talk about his case uh, and then write about it for educational purposes. Mr. T was a 70-year-old man, had had a long history of alcoholism, and Quit drinking. 
but he waited a little too long because it, it affected his brain function. He was suffering from organic brain syndrome, which as a result of his drinking, he had a, re a really pretty good long-term memory. He had been a taxi driver on the Isle of Man off the coast of England. And he could tell lots of stories, but if you t asked him a question about what you had been talking about five minutes before, he wouldn't be able to remember it. So his short-term memory wasn't very good. His long-term memory was okay. And Mr. T lived in a little house in Hermosa Beach, California with his wife. They'd been married for over 50 years. And he'd been getting along pretty well despite his memory problems until one day he got some gangrene in his toe. And it was painful, and his wife called a doctor who remarkably was willing to come to the house, but Mr. T wouldn't let the doctor touch him. The doctor looked at his toe and said, it's not good. Uh, it might be that it'll, you know, go for a long time without causing any problems, but it could have an infection, get into your bloodstream, go right up and cause septicemia, and you'll die. And if we... We have to make a decision whether to watch and wait or to do surgery. But I can't, if I can't examine you fully, I can't give you any good advice. And he said, I don't want you to do anything. The doctor left. Well, Mr. T had a habit of smoking. And uh, while he was lying on the couch one day, smoking a cigarette, he fell asleep. The couch caught on fire. And his wife called the fire department and the police, and they came, and they put out the fire. Fortunately, nobody was injured. Uh, and his wife, in desperation, said, well, what can I do? You know, he's, uh, he's got this thing with his toe, and he won't let the doctor see him. They were able to take him to the hospital and admit him as a psychiatric patient uh, because he was suffering from a mental disorder, as a result of which he was dangerous to himself. And part of it was he didn't believe that he had gangrene. He wouldn't believe what anybody was telling him about his toe, that this was a problem. So he's in a psychiatric hospital, and the psychiatrists wanted to have the surgeons come in and do the surgery. Now, you can put him in a psychiatric hospital and treat him for his mental condition, but you can't do the surgery without his consent or somebody's authorization. Well, he wouldn't consent. He was the same. I don't want anything. In fact, he was willing to have them debreed the toe and get rid of the sort of dead skin and give him pain medication. So he felt like he was getting better, uh, even though his really underlying condition wasn't being treated. After 30 days in the hospital, he went back home because the psychiatrist has much trouble deciding what to do as he did. I'm just joking. <laughs> I would never uh, accuse my psychiatrist friends of being indecisive, but. Uh, he had the right to refuse. He was legally competent to refuse the medical treatment. He just couldn't refuse the psychiatric treatment. So when he went back home, his wife was told, well, you know what? We can get the, the county attorney to come out here, and we can petition the probate court to have him declared incompetent and then have a judge order the surgery. So that's what she did. The judge, however, was a pretty clever guy. He said, I'm not going to just rule on this case on the basis of one attorney. I'm going to appoint a lawyer for Mr. T. And he said, I'm also going to appoint a third attorney to be my lawyer, to conduct an independent investigation and make a report to me. I was the third attorney in this case. And so it was very interesting because I was given a lot of authority to call a meeting. And I got, the, I got the two lawyers, the patient, his wife, his daughter, and son-in-law all to meet at his house. And we had a big meeting. And I also brought in my own expert. I brought in a psychiatrist lawyer who was going to evaluate him for his competency. Well, it turned out to not be very easy because Mr. T was, he was a very articulate guy unless you tapped into his memory problems. And he simply did not believe that he had gangrene. So the psychiatrist lawyer thought that he was incompetent. Since I'm a psychoanalyst, I was able to do an interview as well. So I did an interview with him. And 
somewhere in the course of, he was kind of getting cranky at this point, but somewhere in the course of that interview, I said to him, all right, I know you don't believe you have gangrene, but let me ask you this question. What if you did believe you had gangrene and the doctor said you needed surgery, what would you do? Oh, I'd say operate. <laughs> so I thought, got him. <laughs> you know, I figured out what he would do if he believed what was actually true. Well, it turned out not to be that easy because even later he vacillated again. He would say that and then if you ask him that same question, he might say, no, I wouldn't tell him to operate because God's going to take care of it. And when we went to court, the same thing happened. He, he sort of, this is what we call waxing and waning. You know, he would say one thing, they'd say the other. And, and so to make a long story short, after the hearing, I mean, I, I sat with him at the hearing table. And, and I, at some point after it was over, the judge asked him if he had any questions. And he said, no, no, Your Honor, I think you seem like a very honorable man. Uh, and then the judge retired for a few minutes, came back out and said, I'm going to order the amputation. And he explained to Mr. T why he was doing this. And Mr. T, who had been totally uncooperative with his physicians, just no problem. He, he was perfectly happy when the judge told him he had to do it. OK, whatever you say. I mean, I was, I was sort of so surprised that he would, had that reaction. Well, he had the surgery. And the judge had told the, all of us, including the social workers that were involved, when he gets that surgery, I want to make sure that he gets proper rehabilitation. Because when people have amputations, they get depressed. Now, he went, to the surgeon, went through the surgery, he recovered fine, but he wouldn't participate in the, in the rehabilitation. He wouldn't accept the prosthesis. He got depressed. 30 days later, we had another meeting with the judge, and he said, this isn't, a, this isn't good enough. We need to do something. So we, we tried to figure out what to do. Finally, what we did is that we got him placed in a nursing home with his wife. They both were eligible for the nursing home, even though she was competent and could go out and her family would take her places. Once we got him in the nursing home, he was fine. He wouldn't get out of his wheelchair. He wouldn't, do, he wouldn't have a prosthesis. He wouldn't walk. But he was perfectly comfortable in the nursing home. The only problem they had was getting him to take showers. Right? But you know that was manageable. They could cajole him into the shower, and they'd have to have somebody would have to hold him up. Um, so it was a little inconvenient. A year later, I went back to see him because often you know you get involved in these cases, you never know what happens. But I had heard that he was doing fine, so I went back to see him, and I said, "Do you remember me?" I don't think he really did. Uh, but I said, we went to court. Do you remember that? He said, oh, yeah, we went to court. I went there to get permission to have my foot amputated. <laughs> you know? I mean, I never could make up my mind whether he was competent or not. I mean, he clearly had impaired decision-making capacity. His judgment was wrong. But he, he couldn't do this for himself. I mean, it took, this was an unusual situation that we had three lawyers, a judge, a social worker. The fa but the family weren't helpful here. They were so intimidated by this old guy because he was the boss. And so you had to bring in, you had to bring in the, you know, the other support team uh, to get this thing resolved. The judge had had his father and his son-in-law had lost limbs in battles in the war. And so he knew about how people react to amputation. And that's why he was so concerned that this whole thing be orchestrated in a certain way. And the judge's empathy for this man, even at the time of the hearing, was what he connected with him in a way which the doctors weren't able to connect. I wasn't able to connect with him. In fact, the, the old man said to me, after my 40-minute interview with him, he said, you know, you've given me such a headache, I'm going to have to take all the aspirin I have in the house to deal with it. <laughs> but you know, he had a sense of humor. He knew what was going on, but he just couldn't. He clearly had limited capacity. Yes? Yeah, you're right. This does sound like an awful lot in a convoluted situation, but it really is maybe a very elaborate um, version of what we are all going through as healthcare providers dancing mm -hmm. between competency, safety, and quality of life. You're absolutely right. And that's exactly what we were trying to do here was, 
you know, what was the best thing for him and his wife? What was his quality of life going to be? Amputation's a big deal. You know, he said at one point, he said, that's a good foot. <laughs> he said, at one point he said, you know, if I just walk in the ocean a few times, I'll be dancing. And you know, it's very hard to say, yeah, well, that's wrong, you know? I mean, it was wrong, but it wasn't going to persuade him. So you're right, we, the, the idea is, is quality of life, safety, respecting his values. We were able to respect him even though we ultimately uh, had a treatment done that he didn't consent to. Although he sort of did consent to it when he said to the judge, after the judge told him he had to have the surgery, it was okay. And then of course memory is a wonderful thing or denial is a wonderful thing. His memory was that he went to the judge to get permission for the very thing that he was refusing. And I, it is an elaborate story but it's not that uncommon. Uh, yeah. Did the judge share with Mr. T his experience, his personal story? No, he didn't. He did with me because I went back after the hearing, I went back to the judge and said, you know, how do you know so much about all this? Because I sensed that there was something going on and he, he said, I, you know, I've been there. I know what he's going to have to go through because I did it with my father and my son-in-law and I want to be sure that, that afterward things are done to make his life comfortable. So the, the point of this story, though, is to acknowledge that decision-making capacity is a real tricky business. And deci even deciding whether somebody's competent or not, even legally competent, is, is you know, problematic. Yeah? I have one question. It's about delusion. <coughs> if a patient has, um, of course, false belief out of context, you know, like me believing I'm the Queen of England. Anyway, in that delusion, is what appeared to interfere with making an informed decision. You know, how ethical or unethical it is to actually treat delusion. I mean, as you know, psychiatrists do all the time, they give us a psychology. You know, as a way of now, with the goal of now bringing the person back to reality, and then hopefully the person will now make an informed choice out of all mm -hmm. choices. Well, if you can treat the delusion, then you can wait. And I mean, if, you, if medically you can wait and you can treat the delusion and then make the decision about, say, what to do about the medical problem, that's okay. But uh, I was following closely the case of uh, Wanda Hudson in Houston a few months ago who had a delusional belief that her son was born because she had been impregnated by the son and that even though he had a what was thought to be a fatal condition and shouldn't be continued to be on a respirator, she believed delusionally that he was going to survive because he was the son of the son. Now, that was a very encapsulated delusion. Nobody could ever dissuade her about that belief, even though in other respects she was very articulate and very competent. And then in that situation, the delusion was controlling. And so a decision had to be made and it was a complicated legal battle and all kinds of other things that uh, went into it. But you couldn't rely on her decision alone because she was delusional. If somebody has a delusion that can be, say, somebody who's schizophrenic and has delusions and they are treated with uh, antipsychotic medication that clears them of the delusion, then they, can make, then they might be able to make decisions. And in fact, we wondered about Mr. T, whether he was delusional about the gangrene, whether there was something you know, worse going on. And in the end, we concluded that uh, at worst it was denial, that it wasn't, he wasn't really delusional because he, he could understand the hypothetical question that I asked him. He just didn't think it applied to him. Um, I mean, if he said, there's no such thing as gangrene, doctors are just making this up, they're just out to get me. You know, that would be a paranoid delusion, and that might not be, you might not be able to get rid of that. Um, but it's a good question. And sometimes psychiatric expertise is what you need. You may need to bring in a psychiatrist to evaluate somebody. Because paranoids, for example, are very good as long as you don't tap into their belief That's systems. Right. Yeah. And so sometimes you need a psychiatrist to come in and, and uh, you know, sort of probe that uh, that 
you know, the potential delusional area. Part of my treatment of the delusion will result in a person now being uh, able to stand trial. For instance, to go for trial and then mm -hmm. potentially be convicted of, of capital murder. Tricky problem, actually. I just finished teaching a course on law and psychiatry, and, we, and it was my final exam had a question just on this issue. Um, I, I had imagined, I actually had a patient once who was like this, who, who believed that any time he saw somebody in uniform, they were out to get him, and he would have to defend himself, and he would get into trouble. Uh, it, would, it would be Federal <laughs> Express, or the postman, or the policeman. Um, and so there's a, there's a famous legal case that went to the U.S. Supreme Court just recently in which a dentist was psychotic and delusional about the FBI and the CIA. He had been arrested because he was engaging in Medicare fraud. And the question was whether he should go to trial or not in light of the fact that he had these delusional beliefs. And he was refusing treatment for his delusion. So he was being held as an incompetent uh, incompetent to stand trial. He probably was in the hospital longer than he would have been in jail if he'd been convicted. And the question then became, can he be treated against his will? And the court, very you know, sort of wishy-washy on this one, they said, well, if the medical treatment is really in his best medical interest, that is, if you really think you can cure his delusion with the treatment, and the condition for which he's going to be tried is sufficiently serious and the government makes a good case for him to be treated against his will even though he doesn't want to we have to balance his right to refuse his right to liberty with the public interest in bringing him to trial and you know then there's a whole list of criteria that you have to you meet those criteria he can be medicated against his will but but not necessarily so it's a it's a, always a tricky issue. Thank you. Sure. I Are think. There any, let's see. Anybody at the uh, or SFA? Uh, we can take another question here as well. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, can a bipolar person, I mean, become a um, decision maker or an agent? Uh, we had a patient was demented and uh, she was going to confabulate, waxing and waning, everything. And appointed, while she was in the hospital, appointed a son from another state to be his uh, or her power of attorney for health care. Yeah. And then she went back to the nursing home. Her son, who was in the nursing home, was bipolar, was paranoid, was schizophrenic, was got all kinds of medications and everything. And he has worse capacity than her. <laughs> and she changed her uh, POA again to him. Now, what can we do in a case like that? Uh, Call for help. He certainly has not. Uh, uh, that's, not a, that's a very good question. And indeed, that is a problem. Uh, there are things that can be done. Number one, now, this is in the ideal world. In the ideal world, you can challenge the authority of the person with power of attorney in court on the grounds that that person is not competent to be the representative. And the court could either appoint a guardian or order a particular treatment, depending on how urgent it was. You know, but that takes time. It costs money. And a lot of times, uh, the, it isn't that, it isn't that easy. Bipolar, you want to catch them sort of uh, in between the two extremes, right? Yes. And you, you, you hope for a moment of lucidity. Now, if it's somebody who's bipolar that takes lithium or other drugs, they often can be, you know, sort of stabilized. But if they're sort of not taking medication, as many bipolar uh, people, or if they do take medication, they often stop. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. And I think that if this happened here at the hospital, they'd call the ethics consultation service, or they'd call psychiatry, or better yet, both. And we would go in and we would try to sort of negotiate some kind of uh, 
situation. I mean, what I do when I have a problem like that, I know how to get the I know how to get to the courts without having to go through all the formalities. So we we would try to find somebody, find a judge who would would give us a temporary order to provide necessary treatment. Or if it's a life-threatening emergency, then you can, you know, you can override both the patient and the agent if you think the agent's incompetent. But that doesn't come up very often, but it can. If you can't negotiate, then you use the legal system as a last resort. But and is it true that in, in Texas, uh, you cannot appoint an agent who does not live in Texas? Uh, no, the Texas law doesn't have that provision. California does. No, no, there's nothing in the Texas law that says anything about the residency of the agent. Uh, it might be a good idea because you don't necessarily want to have people at a distant location being an agent, but it, there's nothing in the law that says that. Well, they've changed it behind my back when I wasn't looking. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, I guess it depends what state you're into or what county, whatever. But let's say you're somebody who knows somebody who's in a nursing home and they need an agent um, assigned to them or something. Where do you go? I mean, let's say you're just even like a volunteer working in this place. And nobody the nursing home should them. have those forms available. Mm -hmm. okay. The medical association will provide them. Any, any lawyer that deals with wills and trusts and probate will have them available. Any hospital uh, will have them available. And incidentally, a person doesn't have to be very competent to appoint an agent. That is, somebody can be, have impaired capacity for lots of things, but still be capable of appointing somebody as their agent. Because all they have to do is appoint somebody they trust. They don't have to go through all of these uh, elaborate reasoning procedures that are involved in informed consent for surgery, say. Um, so even, you know, you don't have to be a family member to be a person's agent. You can be a friend or it can be a clergy, a member of the clergy. Um, people in that are taking care of the patient can't be agents for them. Um, but uh, it's really, it's a real simple procedure. I mean, it's just a piece of paper. It just needs to be witnessed. You can even have one person from the hospital or the nursing home as a witness and one other person. It doesn't have to be even anybody that they know because all they do is witness the, the signature. So it's a, it's a real easy thing to do. And most nursing homes by, in these days surely should be encouraging people to have a power of attorney in the event that they need to have assistance with decision making. And like I said, I would go further and encourage the agents to be around when decisions are to be made to assist, to facilitate the conversation and the decision making and provide information. Okay, any questions from East Texas? Apparently not. Thank you very much. Thank you.